Hey everybody, welcome to the online um, church Bible study, the Back to Basics Bible study. And tonight we're look, looking at lesson nine, lesson number nine. We're moving right along, only three more in this semester, and then we all get a little break and then um, get ready for the September semester. We're going to ask uh, our precious sister Karen uh, to lead us in prayer tonight. Father God, thank you. Thank you for another opportunity to come together as as a class and as as an outreach for anyone that listens to this archived teaching as well. And and we ask the Holy Spirit to come and open our eyes to to the teaching that Dr. Carter is bringing. And we ask that the Holy Spirit has always touched Dr. Carter as he brings us the word tonight in this class. Thank you, Father God, for, for this opportunity to actually be online together as a church family uh, where we can be blessed by your word, blessed by Dr. Carter's teaching through the Holy Spirit. In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen. Thank amen. you, Karen. Thank you. And God bless everybody. God bless everyone. Praise God. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to look at more about the intertestamental period, more about the intertestamental period. Last week we got a good feel for the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha. Tonight we're going to look at more about the intertestamental period, the things that happened, many of the events that took place. And then uh, next week we're going to, we're going to look more at the Apocrypha. We're going to look at more specific books in the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha and then do the same thing in the following week and then wrap up the course. And so we thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, those of you who took the time up to come online live with us. And for those who are watching the re recording, we pray that this recording will be a blessing to you. So tonight we're going to look at uh, what happened to the Jews um, after the recorded events in Nehemiah and during that 400-year period in which there was no written uh, prophetic word from the Lord. And um, the only thing that we can go on are the historical records and the uh, gleaning from the Apocrypha, the Pseudepigrapha, but a lot of things took place within the Jewish community. That's what we want to take a look at tonight. We're going to just briefly look at the Persian period, um, how the Jews survived under the Persian rule. Then the Greeks, when the Greeks conquered the Persians, um, how the Jews survived that. And then the Syrian period. And so what we see uh, during this 400-year period, the dark years, the hidden years, uh, the Jews under the jurisdiction of a lot of different nations. Then there was a period of independence among the Jews, and then the Roman period, um, just before Christ came on the scene. So we'll take a look at that. We'll also take a look at events and things that took place in within the Jewish community, the introduction of the synagogues, how they came into being, well, what is a synagogue, how they came into being. We take a look at the Old Testament canon briefly, how the books of the Old Testament were selected, even though we have gone over that before. we we'll review it again probably <clears throat> next week. And briefly look at the dispersion of the Jews. Um, those of you who have my textbook, um, Understanding the Bible, Revised Version, uh, we're beginning on page 193, 193 of that particular book. Uh, we look at the um, Pharisees, how they came into a being, uh, the Pharisees. We look at the Sadducees. We're going to look at the Sanhedrin Council and then we'll take a look at the scribes. We also might take a look at the zealots, which was a revolutionary group 
uh, that came into being before the time of Christ. And Christ had uh, Jesus had a couple disciples who were zealots, and some other events and uh, phenomenon. So it should be very interesting. Um, lesson tonight, you're going to get a lot of information that most church people don't get in their churches. Most people don't learn in their Bible studies. And the whole purpose of this lesson tonight is to fill in those 400 years to let us know what God was doing with his people and what was happening with his people as um, we, uh, the people waited for another prophet to come forth and bring them the revelation and that next prophet, meaning John the Baptist, who came 400 years after uh, Nehemiah, and John the Baptist came to introduce Jesus Christ. So should be a very interesting uh, lesson tonight. And as you add this to what we're learning with the study of the Apocrypha books, the Pseudepigrapha books, then you'll have a good command to be able to teach a lot of people a lot of different things about um, the, the, what happened to the Jews and, and um, the biblical record and what is biblical, what is not biblical, what is scriptural, what is not scriptural. So learn these things and be able to, we want you to be able to share these with others so that they can grow. Before we get started uh, with this, are there any questions? Seeing no lights, I see one light going on, Dr. Bratton. No, I'm actually not on the computer, but I can get to the computer. Okay, 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 okay. All right. Then, okay. uh, seeing no questions, then let's commence. Uh, the Persian period. The Persians were the rulers at the time of Esther. Esther uh, was a Jewish woman living in a Persian community. She was married to the Persian king. It was under the Persians that Cyrus the Persian, who it is believed Cyrus was the son of Esther, Cyrus the Persian issued the decree that the Jews could return to their homeland. And when Cyrus issued that decree, many of the Jews living in Babylon in, or Persia refused to leave Persia. Now, remember, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, took the Jews captive into Babylon. Babylon was overthrown by Persia. And so by the time of Cyrus, after 70, 70 years of captivity, Cyrus issued the decree that the Jews could return to uh, Jerusalem. Most of the Jews chose to stay in Persia or Babylon. Okay, the Persian period refers to the time of Persian rule after the Jews were returned from exile in Babylon. This period lasted from 430 to 332 B.C., so almost 100 years. Uh, the Jews had been captured in 587 B.C. by Nebuchadnezzar. Later, the Babylonians were overthrown by the Persians. Just as the Babylonians influenced the Jews, so did the Persians. The Persians were overthrown later by the Greeks. So you find different nations rising to power, overthrowing one another. The Persians, who were very fierce uh, 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 men, people, were overthrown by Alexander the Great uh, of, of the Greek Empire. Well, Alexander the Great, who um, came after his father, Philip of Macedon. Philip of Macedon was a Greek conqueror, and then his son, Alexander, conquered the then known world. So the Greek period lasted from 331 to 167 B.C. Now remember when I give you these dates, 
these dates are in descending, descending order. The, the closer you get to the time of Christ, the lower the number of years. And so if we say that King David lived around 1000 B.C., and then we see the Greek period, Alexander the Great coming to power around three, uh, three in the 330s B.C., um, and we see that this Greek period lasted from 331 to 167 B.C. During this time, the Jews, just as the rest of the world, were very heavily influenced by the Greek culture. In 331 B.C., Alexander the Great, at the age of 20, assumed command of the Greek army. By 331, the entire world lay at his feet. Alexander um, assumed command. He inherited the kingdom from his father, Philip the Macedonian, and um, a powerful father, a powerful son. And by the time Alexander was 20 years old, he had inherited the kingdom, the rulership. He ruled the whole world. He ruled the Greek Empire. They conquered the whole world. The world was at his feet. He was only 20 years old. He died at the young age of 30. Alexander, yep, yep. Too many women, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, 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 venereal disease, VD. VD killed Alexander the Great. VD. Uh, he had a lot of women, and, uh, well, that's the way it went. At the age of 30, he was dead. By 331, the entire world lay at his feet. When he invaded Palestine in 332, Alexander showed great consideration to the Jews. He spared Jerusalem, and he offered favors to any Jew who settled in Alexandria, Egypt. Alexander the Great established Greek cities all over his conquered domains. Thus, he spread the Greek culture and language. He died in 323 B.C. So after Alexander, Alexander the Great, we have the Syrian period, the Syrians. Now think of Syria, think of Damascus, which is north of Jerusalem, the Syrian period. Um, and the Syrians had a leader, Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes. I guess I better type this in the window. His name, okay? Because you hear much about him. Antiochus or Antiochus. Epiphanes. Anti Anti Antiochus Epiphanes was a bad man. He was corrupt, very corrupt. The king of Syria, he ruled Palestine from 175 to 164 B.C. He was violently bitter against the Jews. Antiochus made a serious attempt to exterminate the Jews and their religion. So he was not a friend of the Jews. He did all he could to exterminate the Jews. Ladies and gentlemen, the Jews have never had it easy in this world. In 168 B.C., he devastated the temple. He sacrificed a pig on the altar that had been dedicated to God. Now you know this man was hidden for trouble. He devastated the temple. He sacrificed a pig on the altar that had been dedicated to God, and he erected an altar to Jupiter. In addition, Antiochus prohibited temple worship. He forbade circumcision on the penalty of death. Anybody circumcised will be put to death. He sold thousands of Jewish families into slavery. And he destroyed all of the copies of scripture that could be found. That was Antiochus Epiphanes. More about him in a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, 
those of you who know me and, and Dr. Gene Bratton has known me for many years and others have known me, I've been preaching for years. Study your Bible. Learn your Bible. The day will come. The day will come where there will be no Bibles. People laugh when I say that. People take it lightly. They take it for granted. But I insist, learn your Bible. Study the Word of God. Hide the Word of God in your heart. Memorize Scripture because the day is coming where there will be no Bibles, where people who are caught with Bibles will be put to death. We already see this in China and in many Arab nations, in North Korea. If you're caught with the Bible, they will put you to death. So this is not a new thing. Antiochus tried this. And uh, you'll see um, during many times of history where corrupt rulers will try to destroy the word of God, destroy any connection people have with God. And that's one of Satan's main strategies. Well, he, slithered, he slithered up to Eve in the Garden of Eden to separate her and Adam from God. Satan's uh, attempts, his strategy has not changed. He does not want people worshiping God. And so Antiochus prohibited temple worship and he forbade circumcision on the penalty of death, sold thousands of Jewish families into slavery and destroyed all of the copies of scripture that could be found. Antiochus slaughtered everyone discovered in possession of any copies of the scriptures including scrolls and manuscripts and he resorted to every conceivable torture to force the Jews to renounce their religion. The atrocities and persecutions of the Jews under the ruthless regime of Antiochus led to the revolt of the Jews led by Judas Maccabeus and his brothers. It is because of Judas Maccabeus and his brothers that there was some hope for the Jewish nation that the Jewish nation survived because they had a fighting force that would uh, uh, help them against the tyrannical rule of Antiochus Epiphanes. And um, the writings of 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th Maccabees are very important pieces of literature. They were not uh, received as being canonical because of the the doubt the doubting of the authorship okay but the writings are very important in giving us a good taste of Jewish history during this period of time this revolt led by Judas Maccabeus and his sons Judas and his brothers was one of the most daring feats in the history of mankind and so when Judas Maccabeus revolted against the Syrian government uh, the Jews had a period of independence and that period of independence lasted between 167 and 63 BC this period has been called the Maccabean the Asmonean or the Hasmonean period a priest named Mattathias, Mattathias or Mattathias, infuriated by the attempt of Antiochus Epiphanes to destroy the Jews and their religion, Mattathias gathered a band of local of loyal Jews and revolted against Syrian rule. Mattathias and his band showed intense patriotism and unbonded courage. Mattathias had five heroic and warlike sons, Judas, Jonathan, Simon, John, and Eleazar. After Mattathias, the mantle fell on his son, Judas, for leadership of the Jews. Under Judas's leadership, the Jews won many heroic battles against unbelievable odds. In 165 BC, Judas Maccabeus reconquered, purified, and rededicated the temple. This was the origin of the Feast of Dedication. Look, let's look back. Let's uh, walk back on this. Antiochus Epiphanes, the Syrian cutthroat, 
uh, the ungodly leader of Syria did all he could to wipe out the Jewish religion and to exterminate and wipe out the Jews. Okay, he's coming out of the background of people like Haman and others who wanted to wipe out the Jews. He's coming out of a background of people like uh, Pharaoh. And so throughout history there have been men, nations, groups who have attempted to destroy the Jews. Why destroy the Jews? Because God chose the Jews as his people and God showed special favor to the Jews and, and Satan's whole purpose is to destroy people who follow God. Satan has always used giants and, and has demonic giants today in an effort to destroy people who want to worship God. Satan hates you, ladies and gentlemen. Some of you need to get serious about Jesus. Some of you need to teach your family members to get serious about God and worship Jesus Christ. There ought to be a mandate on every household, ladies and gentlemen, to get to know the Lord Jesus Christ while there is time. Because when you look around and we, when you look at the reality of the situation today, the cards are stacked against followers of Jesus Christ because Satan is using everything he can, including a coronavirus, to wipe people out and to prevent them from worshiping God. But, however, three dots, dot, 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 uh, 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 therefore, God is moving mightily to preserve his people. God has uh, preserved his word. He's given us his word. Uh, he wants us to read the word of God, study to show ourselves approved unto him, workers who need not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. God wants us to study his word and to hide his word in our hearts. God wants us to know that his word will not return unto him void or empty, that everything he promised to do, he will do. He will hasten his word to perform it. God wants the world to know that his eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth seeking to prove himself strong on the behalf of those whose hearts are perfect toward them. God wants to show himself strong. He wants to prove himself, and he will protect everyone who loves him. He will protect you from a coronavirus. He will protect you from, from uh, 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 violence and, and murder and, and, and mass destruction. God will protect you from whatever Satan sends along the line. And so as we look at this history, we ought to be strengthened. We ought to be reinvigorated. We ought to be freshly anointed with a greater uh, resolve, a greater determination to worship the Lord God Almighty. And we ought to look at the Jewish people and, and look at all the things God did for them, and yet they still denied Jesus when he came. But God still loves them and offers them the opportunity to get saved. And so we look at this uh, 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 period of independence and where Judas Maccabeus and his sons uh, led the, the Jewish people and they recaptured Jerusalem. They cleansed the temple. They cleansed the altar. They purified the temple. And they instituted the Feast of Dedication. In other words, they took all the corruption, all the ungodliness that Antiochus Epiphanes had done, including sacrificing a pig to the, his so-called God Jupiter on the altar of God on, in the temple of the Most High God. Judas Maccabeus had to go and and purify the temple, purify the altar, purify the people, sanctify the people, and, and rededicate uh, the temple to God. A great, a great, a great man and a great family. Then after Judas Maccabeus and his family, we see the Roman period. So here's the sequence. We see the Babylonians carrying the Jews into captivity for 70 years. 
We see the Persians overtaking the Babylonian uh, Empire and the Jews under the control of the Babylonian, of the Persians. Then we see the Greeks conquering the Persians. And then we see the Syrians conquering the Greeks. Then we see the Romans conquering the Syrians. Ladies and gentlemen, in the sequence of history, we've seen nations that they are horrible, strong, bad, fierce, ferocious uh, nations. But God is greater than every one of them. God always raised someone up to conquer somebody else. But God uh, is, is greater than any conqueror that has walked on this earth. God's whole scheme of history is to let you know that kings rise and kings die. Kingdoms come and kingdoms go. But the kingdom of God will last forever. Sound like I'm preaching now. The kingdom of God will last forever. And so uh, those of you who are listening to this are recording. You might be in a teaching session in Kenya. You might, you might be in the uh, Caribbean. You might be anywhere in the world in America. And, and if you're not saved, you're attending Bible study tonight, you're listening to this recording, uh, you're listening by way of uh, YouTube, and if you're not saved, I ask you to get saved tonight, today. Get saved this day. Ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and be your Savior and Lord. Receive the gift of salvation so that when the end comes, you are preserved. You are preserved. Then after you get saved, teach others. Uh, uh, find a church where you can be taught the Word of God. Find an anointed pastor who can teach you the Word of God. And then also study for yourself. Get your Bible. Learn that Bible. Ask the Holy Ghost to fill you with his presence and to teach you about God so that you can teach others because the time is winding up, ladies and gentlemen. Time is winding up. And so the Romans, the Roman period uh, lasted from 63 B.C. until the time of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was born during the time of the Roman rulership of Palestine. In the year 63 B.C., Palestine was conquered by the Romans under Pompey. As a result of this conquest, the Romans appointed Antipater, who was an Edomite, a son, a descendant of Esau. When the Romans conquered Palestine in 63 B.C., Pompey, the leader, the general who led the, 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 the invasion, Pompey appointed Antipater, who was an Edomite, a descendant of Esau, to rule over Judea. Antipater was succeeded by his son, Herod the Great. So Herod was a descendant of the, the Edomites, or the, a descendant of Esau. And there was war. There was constant war going on between the Jews and the descendants of Esau. Antipater was succeeded by his son, Herod the Great, who ruled as king of Judea from 37 to 3 B.C. He ruled 34 years from 37 B.C. to 3 B.C. And it's um, believed that in 3 B.C., that Jesus was actually born in 3 B.C. When you set the calendar back and readjust the calendar, um, they, they, they recalculated that uh, uh, his, his birth to be 3 B.C., which is actually, actually uh, uh, 1 B.C. Well, I won't go into that. Herod was a very brutal and cruel man. He rebuilt the temple with fervor. Why did he rebuild the temple? To keep the Jews under subjection. He kept those priests under his foot. He kept the Jews under uh, uh, subjection. And he obtained favor with the Jews as long as they had their temple. Uh, they were cool with him. And he could, he could rule them, subdue them. And he, Herod had a relationship with, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. And he kept them under his thumb. Herod was a very shrewd politician. 
He kept the so-called religious community under his wing. Sound like somebody else I know. Okay. It was Herod who killed the children of Bethlehem. It was Herod, the son of uh, Antipater, who was an Edomite, a, 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 an enemy of the Jews going back to the time of the struggle between Jacob and Esau. Okay, so by the time Jesus comes on, on the scene, um, the Romans have conquered the Jewish people. So we see the Babylonians conquering them. We see um, the Persians conquering the Babylonians. We th see the Jews being set free to go back to Jerusalem during the time of the Persians. Then we see the Greeks coming uh, about 100 years later. The Greeks conquer the world, and, the, and th all, thus they conquer Palestine. Then we see the Syrians uh, yeah, about a hundred years later, conquering the Greeks, and then the Romans conquered the Syrians. Very interesting history when you uh, look at the intricacies of it. Okay, just a word about the Old Testament canon, C-A-N-O-N, -N, the Old Testament canon, or the lineup, or the selection of the books that went into the Old Testament. Okay, these books were selected by about 250 B.C. By around 250 B.C., the Jewish rabbis had selected, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the books that make up the Old Testament. The word canon came to be used as the name of the list of books which were recognized as the genuine, original, inspired, authoritative word of God. Early in history, God began the formation of the Bible, which was to be the medium of his revelation of himself to man. And this development looked something like this. The Ten Commandments were written on stone. Moses' laws were written into a book. Copies of this book were made. Joshua added to the book. Samuel wrote in a book and laid it up before God. This book was well known 400 years later. Prophets wrote in a book. Ezra read this book of God publicly. We see this in Ezra 7 and 6 and in Nehemiah 8 5. In Jesus' day, this book was called the Scripture, and it was taught regularly and read publicly in synagogues. It was commonly regarded among the people as the Word of God. Jesus himself repeatedly called this book the Word of God. So we see how this... The Word of God uh, evolved uh, throughout history as God revealed his Word to people. He gave Moses the commandments written on stone. Moses took the commandments and wrote, a, wrote them in a book. The copies of this book were made. And we're looking at Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the book. Joshua added to this book. Samuel then added to the book. This book was well known 400 years later. Prophets wrote in the book. By the time Jesus came along, the book was known as the 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 um, the Psalm, the, the the Word and the Prophets. Okay, the Word and the Prophets. Okay, the Scriptures and the Prophets. Just when the group of books was com completed and set apart as the definitely recognized. Word of God. When when that actually happened, uh, the, that whole period is kind of obscure to us. The Jews' tradition was that it was done by Ezra. It's believed that Ezra, Ezra led the uh, Jews, the rabbis, into selecting the various writings from the various writings and choosing the canon. Okay. Um, and so led a, 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 a great council, and, and those books were selected, is believed, by Ezra. And so by the, roughly 250, 253 B.C., the books of the Old Testament were established. Uh, copies were made as needed. In the Babylonian captivity, they were scattered and many copies were destroyed. 
Ezra, after his return from the captivity, reassembled. He reassembled scattered copies and restored them as a complete group to their place in the temple. From temple copies, other copies were made for the synagogues. Uh, a very fascinating study, if you're uh, interested in this, is a study, How We Got Our Bible, How the Bible Came Into Existence. It is fascinating how the Old Testament uh, books were put together, and then the New Testament books. And then uh, added to that, in the New Testament, after the New Testament books, um, the, the effort of men to translate the Bible from their vernacular, uh, from the original Greek or, or Aramaic or, Ro or even the, the Latin and the Hebrew, into the vernacular, lang vernacular languages. Satan tried to prevent that. Satan killed a lot of people in England and Germany and France and Italy who attempted to translate the Hebrew and the Greek into the, the then known languages uh, prior to Martin Luther King uh, and Zwingli and others coming on the scene in, in the... Uh, 1500s okay and so which leads us now up to let's talk about uh, the synagogues and then I might come back with some more information on the synagogues synagogues were introduced during the days of the captivity exactly when synagogues began we don't know but we believe that synagogues started the synagogue started during the captivity in Babylon with the destruction of the temple. And I'm, I'm on page 195 in our book, Understanding the Bible, the Revised Ver Edition. With the destruction of the temple and the nation scattered, there was a need for places of instruction and worship wherever there were Jewish communities. So even though the temple had been destroyed, and even though the people had been scattered and carried away into captivity, there was a need to instruct the people in the word of God. And um, even with Jeremiah, Jeremiah was carried away into Egypt against his will, but the uh, Jews decided to take him with them. So... Uh, wherever they were, they had developed places of instruction. And these places of instruction were called synagogues. It is believed that the synagogue began in Babylon. The intertestamental period. Uh, in that period, Jews outside of Palestine came to be more numerous than those living in Palestine. They procreated. They grew to be strong colonies of Jews in every land and in all the, there grew to be strong colonies of Jews in every land and in all the chief cities of the civilized world. And so it's believed that the synagogue actually started uh, there. Let me go to another source. A synagogue is a Jewish place of worship and center of Jewish community. Synagogues likely came into use during Israel's Babylonian captivity, although Jewish tradition claims its use as early as the time of Moses. Scholars agree that synagogues were common at least before Roman captivity and the destruction of the temple. The synagogue is a place of prayer, a place of instruction in the Jewish scriptures, and a place of judgment by the Jewish court. Mark, uh, Luke 4, 16 to 21, describes a typical Sabbath at the synagogue. Luke 4, 16, 21 says, And he, Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and, it was his, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So I'm describing a typical Sabbath in a synagogue in Jesus' time. And he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he said to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. For those of you who just joined us, we're talking about uh, what happened during the intertestamental period and um, what happened to the Jews. We've reviewed in this lesson how they were conquered by many nations. And uh, now we're looking at some of the events and things that took place. We're looking at the development of the synagogue. Later we'll we look at the uh, scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and other events. We can glean from this passage in Luke 4, 16 to 21, that on a typical Sabbath, the scriptures were read. The congregation would stand for the reading of the scripture. And the rabbi would sit down while he instructed them. So we see that the scriptures were read, and the rabbi would give instructions. The early church used the synagogue as a launching point for missions when they went to a new city. Acts 17.2 explains, Paul went in, as his, was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. So whenever Paul, whenever the evangelists travel, and ladies and gentlemen, I use the word evangelist. The evangelists, that means they were serious evangelists. We're not talking about Republican American Christians. No. American Christians who belong to the Republican Party. We're talking about people who had a heart for God, a real heart for God, and for the souls of men and women. Well, whenever they traveled during Paul's time or John's time or Peter's time or James's time, they went into a city, and because they were Jews and Jewish believers, they found a congregation of Jews and looked for opportunities to declare the scriptures to the Jewish people so that the Jewish people could be saved. With the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the synagogues gained more importance. The Jews could no longer make sacrifices in the, the temple. <clears throat> and while there is no animal sacrificing in the synagogues, the synagogue did take on some of the functions of the temple as it became the sole place of worship for the Jews. Today, the synagogue is still the center of Jewish religion and community. They hold services on the Sabbath. They have classes on Torah and Talmud. And the Jewish community gathers there for prayer, festivals, and celebrations. So that's a little about the synagogue. Let's talk now about the scribes. I'm on page... Well, no, let's talk about the Pharisees. The Pharisees, top of the page 196. The sect of Pharisee, the sect of, <laughs> the sect of Pharisees is thought to have originated in the 3rd century B.C. in the days preceding the Maccabean Wars, when the Greek do domination and the Greek effort to Hellenize the Jews was strong. So we, it's believed that the Pharisees came during the time of the Greek domination in the 300s B.C. There was a strong tendency among the Jews to accept Greek culture with its pagan religious customs. The rise of the Pharisees was a reaction and protest against this tendency among their fellow countrymen. So the Pharisees rose up to prevent the Jews from adopting the Greek customs. The aim of the Pharisees was to preserve their national integrity and strict conformity to Mosaic law. The Pharisees later developed into a self-righteous and hypocritical, into self-righteous and hypocritical formalists. So to, to review that, 
The Pharisees rose up and grew with the purpose of resisting Hellenization or becoming Greeks. They resisted the impact of the Greek culture on the Jews. But then later we see at the time of Jesus, the Pharisees are really a group of self-righteous and hypocritical formalists. Formalists mean they studied the word and they were very hypocritical, very self-righteous. They denounced everybody. And they became great pro proponents of Jesus and his work even though Paul had been one of them and was delivered when he was saved, he was delivered from this pharisaical lifestyle. The Pharisees fought Paul to uh, uh, everywhere he went. <clears throat> uh, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. They believed in the resurrection of the dead. However, Later, the Pharisees did not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. They believed in the resurrection of the dead, but they did not believe Jesus rose from the dead. The Sadducees, on the other hand, did not believe in the resurrection. Okay, let's see if I have any more about the Pharisees before we jump to the Sadducees. If there are any questions, as of this point, I'll entertain any questions that you may have. Okay, then let's take a look at uh, some more about the Pharisees and something about the Sadducees. The Sadducees, and I always say, like to say, tell people, they were sad, you see. The Sadducees and the Pharisees were religious sects within Judaism during the time of Christ, having originated more than 100 years before his birth. These two sects were essentially the ruling class of Jews in Israel during this time. Both sects had members in the Sanhedrin council. Now, the Sanhedrin was the ruling body that governed the Jewish people. There were 70 of them, actually 71 with their leader. Despite these similarities, there were some major differences between the two groups. The Sadducees were the more wealthy and sophisticated group. They were politically minded and often compromised with secular leaders in exchange for more power. So the Sadducees were the wealthy Jews. They were political. They exchanged uh, 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 whatever they could for more power. As such, the Sadducees welcomed Roman rule. Whereas when you look at the Pharisees, when they first came on board, they resisted Greek rule. Well, the Sadducees welcomed Roman rule because the more the Sadducees kissed up to the Romans, the more favor they received. So when you look at Herod the Great, the Edomite, the descendant of Esau who hated the Jews, Herod built a temple for the Jews, and the Sadducees uh, uh, kissed up to Herod so they could good, get great favor from Herod. So Herod was a shrewd politician. He kept the Jews under his thumb by giving them favor by building, rebuilding their temple, uh, the temple that had been rebuilt by uh, Ezra and Zerubbabel, uh, and when the walls were placed up by, re reconstructed by Nehemiah, that temple went into shambles eventually, and Herod rebuilt that temple as a favor to the Jews. And so the Sadducees loved Herod. They kissed up to him. Why? Because they wanted political power. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got a lot of people in America and the nations today. They kiss up to these ungodly kings and presidents and leaders because they want favor and political power. Everybody in the church, ladies and gentlemen, do not have 
Everybody in the church does not have Jesus Christ as the center of their objectivity. Others have political power. Others have favor. Others want position. There are people, even in the church, who will do anything to get that favor and position, who will sell their souls to kings and presidents and governors to be in leadership position to get the, the benefits. So this is nothing new. The Sadducees welcomed Roman rule. They controlled the high priesthood. They held a majority in the Sanhedrin. The Sadducees subscribed to a more literal interpretation of Mosaic law and were exacted exacting and keeping Levitical purity. They viewed only the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. They viewed only the Torah as canonized scripture. The Sadducees only accepted the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They did not accept the, the, the prophets and the writings as Jesus did. They did not view oral law or tradition as authoritative or binding. They were theologically unorthodox as they did not believe in an afterlife or any sort of spiritual realm with angels or demons. The Sadducees did not believe there was life after death. I guess there must be a whole lot of them in hell saying, I wish, I wish, I wish. They place a high priority on the fact that people have free will. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many, many Sadducees alive today. And all of them are not Jewish. Okay, there are many people who do not believe in an afterlife. They don't believe that there's a hell. They don't believe there's a heaven. Uh, and they believe that people have free will. You can do whatever you want to do. Uh, you're only here for a short while, so uh, go for all the gusto you can get. These were the Sadducees. They were sad, you see. In contrast, the Pharisees were seen more as the sect of the common man. The Sadducees were the nobility, the wealthy. But the Pharisees were the sect of the common man. They championed human equality and emphasized ethics over theology. Their main priority was the religion of Judaism, so they resisted secular influence, including Roman rule. Their resistance led them to be separatists, wishing for Israel's freedom and independence. Relig religiously, they believed oral law and tradition held as much authority as written scripture. Jesus criticized the Pharisees for elevating tradition as equal to scripture, saying, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. So uh, we don't teach much about tradition but tradition is man's oral law. It's not written in scripture. It's oral tradition. You know, uh, things that grandmama said and great-grandfather said and, 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 and we used to do this 200 years ago. And the oral tradition, the oral tradition is still strong today, ladies and gentlemen. Even in the church, the oral tradition, uh, which is not scriptural, the oral tradition People still do a lot of stuff based on oral tradition because, you know, uh, uh, Daniel Boone did it and Jim Bowie did it and George Washington did it and Thomas Jefferson did it, okay? The oral tradition has a strong impact on people's lives today. Grandmama said this and great-grandfather did this. Okay, so... The, the Sadducees were the wealthy, the well-to-do. They controlled the Sanhedrin Council. They had a good connection with the government. They kissed up to the government. They made sure that uh, whatever the government wanted, they did it so they could stay in power. They ruled over the Jews 
because they had the majority vote in the Sanhedrin Council. And the, um, if you were to compare, the, compare this with English government, the Sadducees were like the House of Lords in English government, and uh, the Pharisees were like the House of Commons in the English government. Okay? Or if you were to, or to relate it to the uh, American form of government, the Sadducees were more like the Republican Party in the, in the United States and the Pharisees more like the Democratic Party. Okay. The Pharisees also accepted the writings and the prophets as canonized scripture whereas the Sadducees only accepted the books of the Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy, the Pharisees accepted the writings and the prophets. The Pharisees believed in an afterlife where people received reward or punishment. Similarly, they believed in a hierarchy of angels and demons in the spiritual realm. Rather than emphasizing free will like the Sadducees, the Pharisees believed God's sovereignty could essentially cancel out free will, though free will did still affect a person's life. While the Sadducees controlled the high priesthood and the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, it was the Pharisees who were the teachers in the synagogues throughout Israel. Because the Pharisees' focus was religion rather than politics, they were the ones who most often confronted Jesus. The Pharisees were bitter enemies of Jesus and bitter enemies of Paul after the death of Jesus. When Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed in A.D. 70, the Sadducees ceased to exist. The Pharisees, however, went on to write the Mishnah, an important text that helped uh, Judaism continue beyond the destruction of the temple. Thus, despite there being no sect of Pharisees today, they did lay the groundwork for modern-day rabbin rabbinic Judaism. So that's a little bit more about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Okay, let's look at the Sanhedrin Council. What was it? Okay, let's compare the Sanhedrin with our Congress, our, our Senate and our House of, Rep of Representatives. Let's, let's compare the Sanhedrin with uh, the British Parliament, the House of Lords and the House of Commons. It's a bicameral legislature, a two-house legislature. The Sanhedrin, the word Sanhedrin is a Greek term meaning assembly. Assembly. So this term is, the Greek term is Sanhedrin. Oh, the, the, uh, the um, pretty close to the Greek word ekklesia, assembly. The, Greek, the great Sanhedrin was a court of spiritual leaders in ancient Israel that included 70 men and the high priest. So the Sanhedrin council was 71 people who ruled Israel. During the New Testament period, these men met in the Jewish temple every day except for the Sabbath and the holy days. A look at the Sanhedrin's origins finds its most it first mentioned much earlier. In Numbers 11:16, the Lord commanded Moses to assemble 70 elders to serve as leaders among the people. So that's a good justification for saying that the Sanhedrin actually developed during Moses' time. This was likely connected to the advice Moses had received earlier from his father-in-law Jethro in Exodus 18. There Jethro recommended that Moses delegate leadership to others so he would not wear himself out. So Moses chose 70 elders. And, and God uh, gave, put the whole same anointing uh, that was all Moses upon these elders. A group called the Great Sanhedrin formed later, possibly 
under the leadership of Ezra upon the worship of Israel following 70 years of exile. So we're looking at roughly 550 B.C. 550 B.C., you have a group called the Great Sanhedrin. 70 leaders, 71 leaders actually. Both the spiritual and legal body, the Sanhedrin was the authority in religious matters in Jerusalem, limiting the influence of other nations that ruled over Israel, especially the Roman Empire that would take, later take power in the region. Remember, um, Jesus was tried before the Sanhedrin, before the high priest. Uh, the Sanhedrin had to uh, pronounce the death sentence. Uh, and then recommend that to to um, Herod, okay, or, or to Pontius Pilate, okay. So the Jews had great power through the Sanhedrin, and and the Sanhedrin, uh, um, as long as they worked with the Roman government, they had great power. They were they were powerful rulers. The Sanhedrin also persecuted the early church, following the healing of the man at the temple temple gate in Acts 3. Peter and John stood trial before the Sanhedrin. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. That's what the Sanhedrin said in Acts 4.18. Don't teach and preach in the name of Jesus. The last mention of the Sanhedrin in the New Testament shows them arresting the apostles. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. So Acts chapter 5, 40 to 41, you see the last mention of the Sanhedrin in the New Testament. The apostles were not dismayed or stopped, and every day in the temple and from house to house they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus, or Jesus is the Christ. Following the destruction of the Jewish temple in A.D. 70, the influence of the Sanhedrin suffered greatly. Religious practice shifted from a central focus in the temple in Jerusalem to small gatherings that shifted power to local synagogues in which local Jews worship. Okay. So that's the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. Let's talk a little, about, a little bit about the scribes. You hear a lot about the scribes, the scribes and the Pharisees, page 196 of my book. The scribes were copyists of the scriptures. To be a scribe was a calling of very early origin. The business of the scribes was to study and interpret, as well as copy the scriptures. Because of their minute acquaintance with the law, they were also called lawyers. So scribes were the copyists, the teachers, and the interpreters of the scriptures, and they were called lawyers. They were the recognized legal authorities. The decisions of leading scribes became oral law or tradition. So whatever the decisions the scribes made, this was oral tradition. For example, well, how would we relate that to the United States? The decisions of the Supreme Court become oral law, later also written law. But the decisions, okay, when John Roberts makes a decision or, uh, or when Roger Taney made a decision about Dred Scott, in 1856, okay, these laws not only became written laws, but they became tradition, oral tradition. And so in the Jewish history, there was a lot of oral tradition based on what do the scribes think. So when Jesus came up against the scribes and the Pharisees, he was coming up against powerful people. The scribes were powerful. The scribes were looked at as lawyers. They were looked at as their uh, experts in the law. Ladies and gentlemen, they did not know that Jesus was the Word, and the Word uh, dwelt among us. John said, we beheld his glory, the glory as, the, of, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
So the scribes are very powerful. They were quite numerous in the Maccabean period, and they became very influential among the people. Being a scribe was a vocation of great importance before the days of printing. So if you wanted to send your son and daughter off to school to be somebody, send them off to be a scribe. That's a very important position back in the day. Okay. I have a little bit of information information about the Herodians. You hear a lot about the Herodian party and the Herodians, who were they? A variety of political groups existed in the first century AD. And all of these came out of the backdrop of the of uh, of the um captivity. Jewish life changed when they came out of captivity. And as Dr. Gene Bratton and I were talking earlier before this lesson tonight, the church in America and the church in the world is going to be different after this coronavirus. The church is never going to be the same. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, if you're expecting to go back to church as usual, you're on the wrong planet. The church will never be church as usual. And I want to... I want to encourage God's leaders, pastors, teachers, prophets, apostles, evangelists, teachers, prayer warriors, the body of Christ. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. If there is ever a time in our lives, in the history of the church, that we need to seek God, it is now. Because God is doing a new thing. Ladies and gentlemen, I keep hearing the Holy Spirit saying to me, Personally, I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing in you. I'm doing a new thing in the church. I'm doing a new thing in the world. I was up for three hours last night because the Lord said, I'm doing a new thing. I spent the whole afternoon, this afternoon, in the prayer room because the Lord says, I'm doing a new thing. And so uh, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you and God calls you to prayer, or God calls you to get into the Word and study, seek the Lord while he may be found. Because church is not going to be church as usual. Don't expect church to be church as usual. And, and, and I believe only those who are listening to the voice of God are going to survive. Because after this coronavirus is over, people are going to expect to go back to religion as usual. No, 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 a thousand times no. You will not be able to return to religion as usual. You, you're going to discover these mega churches are going to be the, the, uh, dismantled. They are being dismantled. Uh, some of these folks with these mega ministries are going to learn how to, how to, how to uh, 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 work with people on a one-on-one. -on -one. Work with small groups, something some of you have never done. Work with small groups. It's going, not going to be church as usual. God is looking for a people who will obey him. And as God moves and as the Holy Spirit directs these events, we need to be open to the Spirit of God. Open your heart to God. Repent of your sins. Let no iniquity, iniquity dwell in you. And be ready to move when God moves. I say be ready to move when God moves because God is doing a new thing. Well, let's get back to the Herodians. I mentioned the Herodians. A variety of political groups existed. One of these was the Herodians, a group that supported the Roman leader, King Herod Antipas, or Herod, the son of Antipas. The Herodians were known for their desire to submit to Herod and his rule in exchange for a political favor and peace. We've got a lot of folks today are, are desire to submit to a certain leader for political favor and peace. Okay? Got a lot of them in America. I see a lot of them as I looked at the news today, but in Russia, got a lot of them. Okay? Uh, kissing up to Mr. Putin. Mr. Putin. And to get that favor. Kissing up to Kim Un John. John Un, whoever, in Korea. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you got Herodians everywhere, everywhere. And sure enough, sure enough got some here in America. 
Unlike the Pharisees and others who desired Israel to follow the teachings of the Torah apart from the influence of the Romans, Herodians were willing to work with this outside government in more pragmatic ways. In other words, instead of uh, trying to keep the religion pure, keeping the focus on God, the Herodians said, hey, look, whatever Herod wants, whatever the king wants, whatever the president wants, we're in favor of it. And so, and so what, what happened, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of those zealots, Herodians, they uh, really real are people who resisted the Roman rule and, and uh, became so influenced by corruption and political gain that they found that we can gain more by serving the government than serving God. And that's what we're seeing today. We're seeing a whole lot of people. Hey, we can get uh, faith-based money from the government if we uh, cross over and serve the government rather than serving God. Because when you get faith-based faith -based money, it's government-directed money. The government's going to show you how to spend that money. That dinero is the government's dinero. It's not God's, okay? And so what we see is a lot of people moving away from God. And look at this nation, ladies and gentlemen. Look at this nation. Over 75% of this nation doesn't even attend church. Even before the coronavirus, 75% of Americans don't attend church. A small percentage of people truly worship God in this nation. God's sick and tired of it. He's sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired of the way we treat him. And so expect a new thing. And I'm, I encourage you once again, draw nigh to God. Open your heart to the Holy Spirit. Study the scripture. When, when the Holy Spirit tugs on your heart, come into the prayer room. Separate yourself. Come into my presence. Do that because God is doing a new thing, ladies and gentlemen. So the Herodians were the opposite extreme of the zealots of the time. The zealots believed God alone should lead Israel and resorted to activism and military opposition to end Roman control. So the zealots were like the anarchists we see in these movements. Okay, Everybody out there in this uh, 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 um, um, Black Lives Matter movement, everybody out there is not black, ladies and gentlemen. The, the lady they arrested uh, last week for burning down that Wendy's in Atlanta, she wasn't black. She's out there firebombing Wendy's. Okay? And, and, and so you got in that, in that movement, you got a lot of anarchists, a lot of folks. And they even found some folks in that movement wearing blackface, trying to blend in, burning down buildings, firebombing police cars. Ladies and gentlemen, so... And this is nothing new. Look at the zealots. Look at the Herodians. Okay? People who uh, fake it. They fake it. They pretend they're with you in this revolution to get their own way. And let's burn, 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 baby, burn. Everybody burning stuff down ain't black. Wake up. Smell the, smell the cop. And by the way, I do not promote burning down people's property, anybody's property. I do not... Uh, I do not endorse firebombing people and shooting people and, and, and violence and all this. This is not of God. This is satanic. It's satanic. So Back to Basics Ministries does not condone or go on record. Back to Basics Ministries does not condone violence. Does not condone, condone burning and, and pillaging and and, 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 and uh uh, aggressively attacking people and, 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 and attacking their property. No, no. We believe we're to walk as Jesus walked, in love. We're born again. We've been born again by the Spirit of God. And, and the Spirit of God lives in us, and we walk in love. Well, Pastor Carter, I heard you say one time in your teaching, well, anybody breaking into your house uh, uh, has, no, has no right no human right to walk out of your house if they break in. Yes, yes, even though I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, love the Lord with all my heart, nobody. You come in here and put your hand on Sister Jackie if you want to. I will defend her. I'll protect her. 
I even protect myself. Come on, I ain't a fool now. Hey, okay, all right. Uh, I do not condone violence and murder and burning and looting and all that. But I'll defend my household on my ground. I'll stand my ground in my own house, okay. Uh, but I'm not going to get out there. I don't, and I don't believe the church ought to be out there burning. And, and in fact, we should not even be around that crowd. Come on, somebody. We should not even be around that crowd. We ought to be somewhere where we're praying and praising God and worshiping God because cause, cause, cause Satan is influencing that crowd. And if you're around that crowd, he can influence you. Praise God. So we've talked about the Herodians. We've talked about the Zealots. We've talked about uh, the Sadducees, the scribes, the Pharisees. Okay. And so we've, I think we've covered a lot about the intertestamental period. I do have more information on the scribes and Pharisees, uh, the synagogue. If you want my notes, I'll be glad to send you my notes, and you can add those notes uh, to your library like I've done mine. So when you get an opportunity to teach people what happened during the intertestamental period, you'll have a good uh, command of knowledge to share with, with people in this area. Okay, and so for the next uh, couple of weeks in the course, we'll go next week studying more. We look more in-depth at apocryphal and pseudepigraphal books where, where I'll be sharing excerpts from different books with you. And then the following week, we'll uh, summarize um, th this, this whole period and, and, and do just put the icing on the cake with the... Uh, concerning the hidden books of the Bible, and uh, just to reestablish, reestablish with our Masonic friends that you all don't have anything we don't have. You don't have anything better than us. We have the Bible, the Word of God, and there is nothing scriptural, nothing spiritual about the apocryphal and the pseudepigraphal books. We have got Jesus, and and then we conclude this course. Um, in, in, in Old Testament books of the Bible, they get ready for a powerful, powerful, awesome, worshipful um, semester uh, beginning in September with um, the books of poetry. We're going to look at Job and Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon and, and, and um, enhance worship. Enhance our knowledge of these scriptures. You know, the, the the scriptures have so much to teach us. We can learn. We can learn so much just just from the Book of Psalms. But the whole Bible, when we look at the whole Bible, okay, the whole logos, God's got a plan. And and every now and then I hear the Lord saying what He said through Jeremiah. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you give you good health. So you stay in the Word, ladies and gentlemen. Stay in the Word. Uh, no matter what the world is doing, you stick with Jesus. Make your decisions based on the Holy Spirit. Seek the Lord uh, while He may be found in everything that you do, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do. Do it all to the glory and honor of God. Well, Pastor God, should I wear a mask? You've got to seek God on that. You've got to seek God. Well, uh, should I uh, uh, social distance myself? Seek the Lord on that. Because when you look at the government, they're confused. Okay? Vice president got a mask on. The president doesn't have a mask on. Dr. Fauci's now wearing a mask. Two weeks ago, he wasn't wearing a mask. Dr. So-and-so, Burke, she doesn't know what's going on. Uh, everybody's confused now. The governor of California is saying this. The governor of uh, uh, Florida is saying this. The governor of New York uh, saying this. So you're getting all kind of opinions. But, ladies and gentlemen, let the spirit of the Lord lead you. And another thing, use some common sense. Common sense. I I don't want to be around anywhere somebody's coughing in my face, okay, or sneezing on me, or even breathing down my back. Okay, so mm. protect yourself and protect your family. Protect yourself, okay? You're sitting in church and somebody's sitting behind you and they're breathing heavy and coughing and stuff. 
and, 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 hey, look, look, okay? Be wise. Let the Lord lead you, okay? And, 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 and seek ye the Lord while they may be found. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Let, let us learn how to call unto the Lord, not depend on leaders, and not depend on someone else to make our decisions. Okay? Um, well, enough for that. Walk with Jesus. Walk with Jesus. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Make sure that everything you do, say or think, based on what God says. Okay? Uh, the Sadducees, they specialize in self-will, free will. We can, you can do whatever you want to do. Okay? Uh, uh, the Sadducees specialize that you can live any way you want to. Just, 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 just live any way you want to. No, no, no. God has the plan. He's placed you on this planet for a purpose. Let us seek God for the purpose and obey him in all things. And there, remember, what you do impacts somebody else. You impress your family. You impact your family. And every one of us has someone we're, we're assigned to teach or lead or set an example for. So do it all unto the Lord, to the glory and honor of God. And how better to honor God than to seek him, Lord, what do you want me to do? How shall I do this? In other words, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. That's scripture. Father God, we thank you for our study tonight. We praise you. We thank you, Father, for the wonderful way in which you preserve your Jewish people and, and, and the record of, of your working in their lives and, Lord, I pray, I pray, I pray with all my heart that the Jewish people will repent of their sins and repent for denying Christ as, as the Son of God and Messiah and will open up their hearts and be saved before it's too late. And then in the meanwhile, Lord God, we thank you that you've opened the, the gospel to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. And we pray that people will hearken unto your voice and hear your word and and, 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 and hear the, the word, study the word of God, and, and to get saved, and to honor you, to worship you. And Lord, I thank you that you've given us life, a, a few years on this planet. Help us to live these years to the praise of your glory, and to fulfill the purpose for which you've planted us on this planet. And we love you, Lord. We cannot make it without you. We thank you that you so love the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And so we trust you, Lord. We trust you every day, all the day long. We trust you to supply our every need and to keep us. And we worship you, worship you, and bless you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise Amen. God. Well, we're going to re stop our recording, but I'm always open to anyone who would like to get in touch with me for any uh, answers to questions or, or, or any of your comments you want to share or any way in which I can help you get in touch with me.